Happy Thursday afternoon live, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Brett Wingfield, Tom Matuska here once again to uh, um, give a little presentation on things we think we know and, and try <laughs> to uh, show you some new ideas and, and some things to try at home and hopefully improve your work. And uh, it's winter's coming, fall's coming. I oh, mean, it's we've in got. The air wind mm -hmm. and we have rain and we haven't had the snow yet. We've had a lot of uh, people out west um, on Facebook or texting us pictures yeah. of um, four feet of snow in Wyoming and the Black Hills, lots of snow and that really gets you yeah. excited for deer hunting sitting in the yeah. in the tree all dressed in whites and things, things like that. So um, winter is right around the corner. Yeah. The combines are going? Combines are going like crazy. Yeah. The farmers are um, stopped by a little bit of rain, but they are are really uh, bringing in the grain. I mean, it's yeah. fields are going away, and we can tell it here. We're we're on the edge of Spirit Lake, and anytime the um, fields start coming out, the deer start coming into the yard. And yeah. uh, I just looked out the window today. One of the girls was fiberglassing out in the back, and I said, yeah. "Turn around," and she looked around, and there's a doe standing. 50 feet behind her that time. and we've had a little family of them that must have got displaced and they're out here so you can kind of kind of tell they're losing their forest yeah. so they're going to have to relocate a little bit. Um, last week we talked about pricing, price increases. Um, if any of you think of any questions that arose after our, our discussion uh, don't be afraid to text them in. We're not we're not into pricing this week, but we'll be happy to address any of any questions or concerns you might have, because things are are going up and going away. Yep. It seems like shortages are everywhere. Somebody um, had a picture posted the other day of Walmart toy shelves, and it looked like. Cabela's ammunition shelves. You know, it was <laughs> yeah. kind of kind of bare, yeah. and the poor little kids are not going to have much in their stockings. Um, yeah. But uh, people seem to be hoarding, and that's going to affect all of us, I think. So watch yeah. your prices, and uh, don't get roped into something that you can't get out of. Is what the gist was last week. I think <clears throat> just understand that prices are going to go up, and explain that to your customers that um, you're going to have their yeah. Um, trophy from probably November all the way maybe till September, October, maybe even November of the next year, the following year, and a lot can happen in those times. So, yeah. But help is on the way. It is. Yeah. Uh huh. I saw it on TV last night. Oh, you did. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me about this help because well, I don't know. We're not a political help. show, so I cannot. <laughs> I'm, I refuse to do oh. politics and get roped into that kind of <laughs> quagmire. But the president oh. is um, going to drive trucks day and night, and it's going to be a game changer. So, so you heard it here first. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, but just kind of uh. keep an eye on your prices and don't be afraid to call ahead. And like I said, we have a lot of people calling in and wanting to know what our prices are going to do. And they for sure are going to go up. We're going to keep the percentage as low as we can. And like I said, during the middle of the year, if, if uh, foam triples in price or becomes non-existent or something like that, and you order several forms, we're going to tell you um, we're not going to ship yeah. you a bunch of forms that accidentally went up in price and, and surprise yeah. you with it. So just kind of be on top of that type of thing and check your prices. Check what you're paying for screws. You don't have to count screws oh, because man. Mandy will look on the side of the box and <laughs> find out how many how many screws are in the box. But uh, I mean, little things, screws, Bondo. high paste, shipping is going very yeah. high. Yeah. Shipping, um, everything uh, yeah. is going up. So it's a whole new world and your customers need to know that they are gonna be yeah. expected to pay more for their trophy. Absolutely, absolutely. There's so. no way that we can do business without being competitive and being smart about our costs, so. So if you think of anything during, during this broadcast, um, don't be afraid to text it in, and we'll try to answer it the best we can. There's uh, a lot of unknowns, and all we can do is tell you our best what, guess. <laughs> what we know today. And that's what we know today. I mean, that's probably fair for them to tell their customer, too. 
you know, this is what we know today. Sure. And um, so um, before that, the week before that, we showed you all new products and we've got tons of new products Man. coming out. Um, I think Mandy said she's got another, every year it's 400 new products. We have another 400, she really does have 400 um, does. new and innovative products. And of those 400s, there might be some little incidental ones, but there's some pretty there's major some breakthroughs. There's some we got fun stuff. Exceptional uh, XP forms. We got mm -hmm. artificial uh, prickly pear cactus. We got um, those beautiful um, metal reeds and you know that we did the demonstration on and new habitats and all kinds of stuff so be looking for that she said um the end of the month we'll see how close she comes and and uh you'll be pretty excited to see all that so with that being said um this week we're going to embark we've talked about it throughout the year someday we're going to show you someday we're going to show you someday we're going to show you so this is one of those days we're going to embark on a series of reference, making reference, just talking about reference. And um, when we refer to reference, the first thing that comes to mind is a picture, you know, a picture. Yeah. When Brett and I painted the walleye, um, you know, we did it with this. It was very important to um, have pictures, and I guess we call those 2D. It's yeah. 2D reference, and it's something you can see. I can see how much flesh he has down here. I can see how white the whites are. I can see the transparent, you know, the grays and different colors. I can see how red his gills are or aren't. I can see the yellow uh, markings on the side. So for us, we have volumes of pictures. We have notebooks of deer, of yeah. mountain lions, of every fish that swims, of mm -hmm. birds, bird bill colors, bird feet colors. Yeah and nothing's better than 2D photos, yep. except the real critter. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you can have a fish, some of the best reference photos we have are the ones you took, and I think you took them of a large mouth, maybe a small mouth, oh, in yeah. a, a little shallow a aquarium, yeah. glass aquarium, and you have pictures from all around this fish, these yeah. fish, and it shows so much about fin position and fish fin spread and mouths and gill flaring and not flaring and fascinating, yeah. fascinating pictures, which you can't get from this. That's right. So, yeah. so when we say, you know, pictures are good, pictures are essential, you can't do good taxidermy work without photos, but the live thing is even better. If you mm -hmm. can have a bird, we always used to, I always used to manage to find a cripple on the side of the road yeah. and I would bring in a little swimming pool here and I would have, um, I had wood ducks, I had a gadwall, I had a widgeon. Um, it seemed like every time I thought, oh man, I wish that I got a live bird, I'd be driving down the road and there is one, you know? <laughs> um, and we would bring these birds in and they tame down after a little while and while you're mounting a deer head, you can look over on the little swimming pool and here's the, the gadwall scratching himself mm -hmm. or preening his feathers and you get a whole new appreciation of what, what they can do that you've never seen before. Yeah. So the real, you can't beat the real um, specimen. We had live deer here for 30 some years mm -hmm. and uh, it was really nice to go down and feed the deer, you know, crackers or deer food or deer food or whatever we had and you could pet them, you could scratch their ears, you could watch their eyes, you could see the color yeah. of their eyes and you could learn so much. So don't forget the live animals. Some people have um, access, have places where they can have live mm -hmm. animals. Um, sometimes you might have to travel. You might have to travel to a, a, a game park or a nature park or something like that, or even a zoo and uh, to get a good look at a live, live animal. But that's very important. People ask me um, all the time, since ever I started doing tax for me, what's the hardest thing you do? Mm -hmm. And I, my comment is always the same. The hardest thing we do is the thing we know the least about. And if you do not know what color a bill is or what, um, what shape a fish is or what, how wide open a deer's eyes are, you're not gonna make him look lifelike. Yep. So it takes all of these different reference things, um, photographs, 
the living animal, um, as well as casts. Yeah. And to turn out a really, really, really good looking, realistic product, you have to copy nature. Yeah. You can't pretend. Once you start pretending and think you know how wide an eye should be open or oh, how boy. orange a mallard foot should be, you're probably going to guess wrong. Okay. When you start guessing, your taxidermy work starts deviating from reality. So the more you can arm yourself with all these different reference things, it's really important. Yep. So um, with that, we're going to start today and we're going to show you how to make molds. Mm -hmm. And we probably won't get to the casting material. The mold is like a negative photo, it's the negative. It's what you need to make something like this. You need a mold first, and then this would be the cast. This is a, a white tail that we made. This thing's gotta be 30 years old, 35 years old. And um, we had a nice deer in, and we made a plaster cast of the, of the head. Mm -hmm. And from that, we made a rubber one, is why his little ears are Wiggly. He's made out of latex rubber and he's lasted for, I'll bet, 30, 35 years. Yeah. Um, that, that's so important, that reference material. It's, I've heard people say um, in a Joe Comb seminar, he can tell if he mounts two deer without his reference. By the time he gets to the second deer without reference material, he can tell a difference. And we think that we train ourselves to know these things, but man, that reference, reference material is probably the most important tool in our toolbox and we have all kinds of different stuff um, these casts are are a great way for us to not necessarily have the living animal or the this the animal here in front of us but we have a representation of Closest him so we can get yep. um, no I feel I believe that and I remember that statement from Joe Combs and I find that with myself once mm -hmm. you think I've done this I've mounted as many deer as a lot of people, and you know how to mount a deer. But how come yeah. that deer doesn't look as good as you mm -hmm. know one previous? It might yeah. be um, it might be the products you use, but more often than not, it's that your mind didn't retain you yeah. know the real nature of that deer. Yeah. Um, you're going to get a mannequin, and you're going to buy a mannequin just like we do. Get it. You're going to put the antlers on, set the eyes, mount it. And how come his nose just doesn't look right? It's because you took a stock deer. Yep. Could be right, could be very wrong. Um, there's a lot of deer out there with funny nostrils or wide open mm -hmm. nostrils or, or one high and one low. You're going to mount on that and you're just going to look at him and something bothers you, but you can't quite put mm -hmm. your finger on it. Um, you can get a photo. You can get a deer photo and you can look. Doesn't quite do it for you. You can't have the live deer walking around in the showroom or in the workroom. Nice. Um, we have done that though before. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, now, what if you had a cast from a deer this size, really fresh, that you took off of a really fresh deer? We don't want to make casts, um, study casts out of long deceased animals. We mm -hmm. want fresh stuff are going to give you the best representation. Yeah. But if I had something like this, and I can look at that, and I can compare, just look and compare, if they're the same size animal, I'm gonna start noticing, how come this is like this and mine isn't like that? Mm -hmm. It's because this is closer to real life than what you have here. You so, know, and, and one more to continue on that thought, if you have this in your hand, and we're working on that, one of the big things with artificial noses is one degree or two degree tipped down or tipped back makes a huge difference in the look of that. This is a great piece of reference, but wouldn't this add just a little bit more dimension to, if we had just a little longer, we can look at that shape a little further back. So um, years ago, I think uh, uh, McKinsey had, or uh, research had the John Cargill noses and oh, yeah. still does, yeah. I think. Yeah. But uh, there was no template to cut them off. And I, we yeah. did a lot of bears. And I would get these bear noses and I would cut the mannequin and I'd put the bear nose on. And like you said, one degree or up or down and yeah. that animal all of a sudden doesn't look like a bear anymore. Yeah. You know, he might look like one of those, uh, a taper or something like that. Yeah. You know, they <laughs> yeah. look, something's funny. And so you do have to 
pay very close attention when yeah. you do that. The more information we have in front of us, the better we can use. We try to make these parts for people to use as user-friendly and easy as possible, but without the reference to go with it, um, you know, I think their the quality of work goes potentially up or down. And Kate, I don't know if you can get a shot. This is just some of our reference um, wall up here, and, and it's just a, a collection of stuff over the years that we have found helpful. And uh, I mean, we've got we've got a two-headed pig up. No, we've got a two-bodied pig, yeah. don't we? Yeah. We've got a two-bodied pig with one head. Yeah. Um, yeah. We've got several bears. We've got some pheasants. We had a great giant black bear. Mm -hmm. A um, few antelope, um, there's yeah. an elk, mule deer, muskies, perch, northerns, yeah. bass, black bears, um, audads, desert sheep. Um, I had yeah. a customer shoot a desert bighorn. Um, don't show the dust, there's a lot of dust. In it. <laughs> <laughs> the ones we brought out today, I, we managed to wash before we put them yeah. on the table. Um, but I had a customer shoot a desert bighorn. Now, I would never have access to a desert bighorn. Yeah. They drove through the night. They brought this desert bighorn in fresh as could be. I mean, caped off. It had the yeah. entire skull in it. The minute yeah. the customer left, I went, oh my gosh. And I got out the molding material and I made a mold of it. Yeah. And we have a, a very, very fresh desert bighorn yeah. cast up there. Um, that you can study from. We have bighorns, mountain goats, kudu, yeah. um, all kinds of things. But over years, um, you guys that are just starting out, um, you, don't, you don't all of a sudden have a lot of these. You have yeah. to collect them over time. Um, you feel like being creative today and mm -hmm. you have a really nice largemouth bass laying on the table, make a, make a cast of it, make a cast of all different parts of it. Um, might be a deer, whatever. Um, and you can't spend your time making all these either, you'll go yeah. broke, but, but you do have to have them because yeah. your work will improve the more you work with these, hold them in your hand, compare them, make your work shape-wise look like yeah. all of these. And we have a pretty good library of it downstairs if they want to buy it. Oh, we do. Um, we have some of the best ones from up there on the wall we've got in production downstairs, and you'll see how much work really goes into these um, as we as we develop this forum, but um, if you're in bad need of a bear nose right now, we've got a pretty good bear nose downstairs. We've got some really nice deer. I think we've got some eyes, got ear some eyes reference. Um, so what we're gonna show them isn't necessarily just for one species. We'll, this method will carry through to Correct. deer, elk. Um, and some of the samples um, we have here, I mean, this is a, a bear, and uh, I used to take bear hunters up to Canada and had time to get a lot of reference up there, so we have several um, good reference casts of bears. Unfortunately, all of the bears that I got were a little on the puny side, <laughs> and uh, so when so it comes to a big bear, I might not be able to help you out. They double as coyotes. Mine were, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> mine will go with coyotes. Um, this was uh, something that that all taxidermists struggle with is mm. we call it the throat latch and it's as one. the brisket tapers and goes up into the bottom jaw and your gills will lay right here taxidermists struggle with this area we have a couple we got walleye northern mm -hmm. muskies um, of just this area and the way it was made yeah. is you get the get the gill flaps out of the way and the gills out of the way and just pour a mold of that yeah. and this one was made out of auto body putty mm -hmm. but not only do you have the throat latch, which we initially made the mold to show us, look at the muscles and the little yeah. creases and the little valleys behind where the fin muscle lays in yeah. behind the um, front fins. Oops. And uh, just uh, a lot of different things that that tells you, not just what you took the yeah, cast up. That's, that's super important. Today you might be needing a nose angle, but tomorrow it might be the bridge of the nose or the lip line that you have as a part of your cast too. And we're going to show you how to make a cast of a largemouth bass, probably a head today. Mm -hmm. But this was a reproduction crappie. We made the yep. mold of it. From that reproduction little crappie, we made a artificial fish, artificial crappie. 
and we made it to make another make a reproduction fish, but it never got finished and it lays around here and it's mm -hmm. a beautiful little piece of reference. Yep. You can hold it in your hand and you can look at that fish, you can look at eyes, you can look at lips, you can look at uh, fin placement, all different yep. kinds of stuff. And it could still be finished as oh, a absolutely. reproduction fish. Yep. Yep. Um, this was a large mouth that we um, made, very similar to what we're going to show you today. Yep. And here's a mountain lion. And these um, we'll show you how to make the casts out of a lot of different things. We're going to mm -hmm. show you two kinds of molding materials. Um, today it's going to be rigid molds, and to me a rigid mold is plaster or bondo, mm -hmm. auto body putty, is that right? Yeah. And um, you could use foam for a molding material. Oh, sure. Some people they, use foam. I've seen that. Uh, but there's a lot of different things. But for ease and things that you always have in your shop, we're going to start with rigid molds, and we're going to use plaster as well as auto body putty. Yeah two different variations. And those are one of the least expensive molding materials out there and probably most readily available. Um, easy to grab at the hardware um, store. Show them it. your deer shoulder. That's a um, very good. Yeah, this was, um, this was a project that we needed some information about um, some of the muscle groups in the, in the front shoulder, um, working on a deer sculpture. And this was a fresh deer that we had on the carcass. Um, brought him in and had just taken the, the hide off of it. So this is just the musculature and that was important to us um, that we would be able to best see the definition of what was underneath the skin. And uh, we took that, we poured plaster over it. It's a big mold. It's not something that we needed exceptional, exceptional detail in. So we didn't choose to use a flexible mold. We just used um, inexpensive plaster was able to take that mold and pull it off and um, no damage to the meat underneath. Plaster is pretty um, non-invasive. Rinses so, right off. Yeah, yep. rinses off clean and and uh, so that's really good information. You can see the neck goes this way. We got a little bit of the, of the front shoulder. So that's um, that was a really valuable piece. The positive here is made out of Bondo but the original mold was made out of plaster. So now typically what you're going to have, this is a um, Atlas of Animal Anatomy, which we live by around here. So mm -hmm. we're gonna get a uh, um, deer mannequin or sheep yeah. mannequin, mountain goat, whatever it happens to be. And over years of doing this, we will find in here the closest animal that, that we can that resembles you know, whatever animal we're doing. So say we have a deer, we're gonna find this, this is the anatomy for a stag, roe, or a goat but it basically looks like white-tailed deer to me, but it's got all the different muscles. Now, you're gonna get your form and you're gonna go, wow, that form looks really bland. You know, I, I, mm -hmm. need, I need something, I need some. He looks like he's filled with sawdust, like yeah. the old time, you know, stuffing yeah. taxidermist. Um, so I want, I want him to look like this underneath the hair. Take this along with your cast and you go, all of a sudden the light bulb will come on, you'll go, ah. Yeah. Look at that. I never knew that. Look at this. Look at that. That's yeah. the ball joint. You know, there's his elbow. There's, you know, different muscles in his legs. So this combined with that is yep. going to improve your work a whole lot. Yeah. The more you have for information, the better. Okay. We better get started. I know. Or they're not going to learn anything today. Um, okay. I'm going to go get you something to make a mold of. Okay. And why don't you tell them how you're going to start here and the products we're going to use, and I will bring you some. Got it. So we're going to choose to use a, we're going to make a rigid mold, and we're going to use a bedding material to lay our part in. Today that's going to be a largemouth bass, um, and we need something to prop him up, and we want we're also going to use this bedding material to make sure that our molding, our, because we're using a rigid mold, our material can't cross the center line or we'll never get the part out. So we don't want to encapsulate our, our part without having a way to get the positive out. And you'll see more of that. That might be a little bit confusing. You'll see more of that when we talk about making the positive. But because we're using a rigid material today, 
we're going to use a bedding material. And our choice for bedding material is premium bedding fiber. Um, it's a reusable product. It's an inexpensive product. It, it has some really nice qualities. It binds together. It has a good binder in it. Um, and it smooths out really nice. And that's important um, to getting your part to release nicely. So in the case of a fish, we like to have a nice edge built and we're going to we're going to just kind of focus on this fish just the head but if you wanted to um, this method would be great to use for the entire body but um, today we're just going to build a little dam around the head and I'm just going to take this bedding fiber which um, incidentally comes as a powder and um, you can order it I think we we've, we've got it at, in 10 pound quantities, maybe 10, 20 pound quantities. Um, I'll have to check the catalog, but um, it goes quite a long ways and it needs to be rehydrated. So it comes to you um, as a powder, that way we're not shipping the, the weight of the water and you would simply bring it home and uh, hydrate it with water. And, and what we found, you don't wanna make it it really, really runny soupy with water, but, uh, but you do want to have it well saturated. So you can see I'm just working this with my hand and I'm kind of leaving a space to put that fish in. The front, the front half of him, now I've got some excess out here I'm going to scoop away. And um, I'm just going to build a nice dam and I'm guessing about the height of the fish. So if our fish is three inches high, the center line, because a fish is pretty well symmetrical, the center line would be at about an inch and a half. So that's about the depth that I'm just guessing at this dam right now. Um, and then we'll lay the fish in there and see, um, see where we are. Now, could you do this same method if you wanted to make reproduction fish? How would you do that? Um, exactly the same. And I was thinking about that. Um, didn't we do that for them with that little crappie? So they might be able to look back and you can see how similar this method for reference casts is going to be to, um, to that making the entire fish. So in this case, we're going to bed the head, but there's also some pretty interesting areas too where we might make um, just some small casts as well. Um, once we've got him laid down here, we may as well take full advantage of it. So we might mold three different places on this fish um, just to get some more information. Um, now we use bedding fiber because it because of all of the positive qualities that it has, but um, you might be in the field somewhere um, with your caribou or say a black-tail deer that you killed on the coast and you might only have sand available to you and sand is something you can do just exactly the same the same thing with. You could build a, a nice dam with with sand. So I've got this somewhat leveled out. You can see I'm going to tip it up for the camera so you can see it a little bit. Um, I've just got a little accommodation here that we're going to lay the bass up into and then I'm going to push these sides up against him and like I said we're going to focus primarily on the head. I've got some more material over here if we if we choose to do the tail um, or some other areas. Do you have a question Kate? Yeah. Um, it does. As it dehydrates, um, it will start to harden up, and it, uh, it's not going to be like concrete, but it hardens up. As, like mache, but it breaks apart. Yeah, um, but it's, it is, it, there's no strength to it, so it wouldn't be something that you could count on in its rigid state to, to mold with. It's much more of a, uh, it's a softer product and it's more intended to be used as a, in the hydrated state. But that's a great question too, because we talk about the fact that this can be reused. Um, you can just simply let your, let your bedding fiber dry out, um, crumble it up and put it back in the bucket, and then come back six months later and fill the bucket full of water, let it soak up. And um, we got five bu gallon buckets all over the place with dried we up do. bedding <laughs> we fiber. Do. Um, and if they don't get full of dust and dirt and debris, yeah. um, they work just fine. Um, Reconstitute. I've never thrown it away. Really it'll well. last. It'll last yeah. forever. Um, and 
we do sometimes when we do a lot of fish stuff, we'll put a little bacteria side in the water yeah. just to yeah. just to make sure that things stay nice and pleasant. We'll have a um, five gallon bucket and it's hardened up. We'll let them lay around. Um, we'll take a spade bit in mm -hmm. the drill and drill a whole bunch of holes down in it and then yeah. fill it up with hot water. And usually it will absorb all the water you can put in. Yeah. Um, the next morning, try breaking it apart with your hands and it may take a day and a half before you get it this yeah. consistency, but it will be just like this until it dries out again. Yeah. Do it over and over and over and over. Yep. Um, that's a great way to store it is dry, but we've also found we tried it, what was it, a couple years ago um, that we tried storing it wet. And we and froze it. it. Yep. Um, it worked really good. You had us take some bags of it like this and we actually um, filled the bag probably halfway full and then we pounded it, it out so it was nice and flat, rolled it with a roller and um, we had nice little rectangular bags that were rehydrated, put them in the freezer and then if you know you're going to need it the next day, pull it out of the freezer and uh, let it thaw overnight and it was ready to use. And since then we've been keeping them in the refrigerator. Yep. We've got a refrigerator that we put hides in when we you know, are going to work on them next day or something like that and that bag has been in the refrigerator for how long? I bet a year. I bet a year. <laughs> I really, and I really it do. It smells great. It's, it was nice yeah. and fresh. We added a little water to bring it back yeah. to a nice trawlable consistency. Yep. Um, but, and this, this is available when it's in the refrigerator, it's ready to go. If we had a deer come in tonight, right now, we could, it's ready to work with. We're able to use it so you don't have to wait that day and a half for it to reconstitute. Yep. 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 So um, I think I've talked that into a circle, but now I've got a little spot. Do you want to set up the fish for Okay, we'll do that. Now the something you want to know is we're going to make a plaster mold. And, mm -hmm. and plaster is a very inexpensive, tried and true. Plaster has been around for a hundred and some years. Um, you mentioned, let me show them if I can find it. Oh yeah. You mentioned setting up a fish in sand. Um, there is an old, old book. I don't even want to tell you how old because I got it brand new. Uh, <laughs> it's how to make fish trophies. Uh, this shows, was it the Yale Museum of, I'm not going to be able to find it now. They set up giant sailfish and, oh, oh yeah, here they are. Um, you probably can't see it. I mean, there's a, a marlin and it's the class. How would you like to be in that class yeah, at Yale? I could have passed college if I'd have done that. <laughs> um, but maybe. Um, but I mean, look at the size of that marlin. That marlin's probably a ooh, baby, a eight, nine hundred pound marlin that they did on the beach using sand for a bedding yeah. material. Yeah. Would that not have been fun? That would have been fun. And to I reinforce to it, they use conduit because the mold is going to be so heavy, it's going to take like four or five people to lift half yep. of it. Um, incidentally, at one point in my early career, um, we did all of the state record catfish. Mm -hmm. And Iowa has some pretty big catfish. I don't remember how big they are now, but we had a, a 35 pound channel. We had a, a 70, 80 pound blue cat. Yep. We had a giant flathead. And uh, the state would bring them. They would get them from the fishermen, bring them. And like the channel catfish, they brought me that and they wanted six of them made. Mm -hmm. So I made a mold just like this, like not only not the reference gas, we made the whole yeah. fish using plaster. We made a mold of it and they could, and then we made six positives. So every hatchery could have a duplicate Copy. state record catfish. That's pretty cool. And um, we used to do a lot, a lot of catfish, but all my early molds were made with plaster. And plaster picks up exceptional detail done right. Yeah. Um, it's got its drawbacks. It's heavy to work with, but it's very inexpensive. Um, and it picks up it, pick, yeah. it picks up detail so good it'll pick up fingerprints, yeah. which is pretty darn good. <laughs> that's, that's as good as we need. Did you bring this for me to wash my hands? I did. I'm going to do that. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, now, the one drawback to plaster is plaster reacts with fish slime, mm -hmm. and it will not set up. It, it 
turns goopy and it ruins your project. So fish slime and plaster do not play well together. To alleviate that, what I want to do is I take the fish to the sink, I open his mouth, I spray, we just got a garden hose sprayer, spray pressurized water into his mouth, I lifted up his gills, I got as much out of his gills as I could, all that slime, I got all the slime out of underneath his jaws. Up in here, in the folds where his jaws come together, um, I sprayed in there and got it all cleaned up as good as I can. Then, um, the next thing I like to do is I wiped him down with alcohol, just to make sure I got everything, just real fast, just take a, a rag and squirt him down with alcohol. Then, um, any of the old manuals, like this book says, wash them in aluminum sulfate. I believe so, yeah. And aluminum sulfate is the alum. If you ever heard of a salt and alum tan, many of the tanneries include alum. They'll say they don't, but they include alum in their tanning procedure. Um, it shrinks things. Mm -hmm. um, it tightens things, and it closes pores, which keep keep slime from reacting with your, um, with, your uh, fish, with your plaster. So I just got a little bit of water here. I don't have to measure it out. I'm probably, let's say if I've got uh, two cups of water, I'm gonna put in a tablespoon of um, alum. Mm -hmm. Didn't measure it out. I'm just gonna stir it around. Alum is what they make pickles. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty non-threatening. I think moms used to keep it in their cabinet for canker sores. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. We were talking about mm -hmm. that. It's too bad they can't see our really tan camera lady today. <laughs> well, she's the one pointing the camera. Okay, now I'm just going to take the alm water and I'm going to just swab this fish where I'm going to put the plaster. So we're doing a, you're doing a little bit of work to prep the fish itself before we are ready to make a good mold. You will, you will know if you don't clean him up and get all the slime off, um, your project's going to get botched. Mm -hmm. And um, you're going to wonder why. And um, you're going to go back and watch this and you're going to say, ah, oh, I forgot the alm. And I think you could probably get by just fine with um, um, pressurized water and wipe them down with alcohol. Um, you're probably going to be fine, but the alum is very helpful and it gives you a really nice, nice project. Yeah. And now just in that head, um, you're making this mold. We're going to have information about how to set the eyes. We're going to have information about rebuilding the epoxy, doing the epoxy and rebuilding shrinkage in the top of the head. Um, there's a whole bunch of information you're going to get out of. So now we just stick him down in here. Whoops. And try not to get any of the bedding material where you don't want it. Then smooth them out. Yeah. And as you're doing this, you're just going to go right up to the center line. How do we do for shape? We do okay. There we go. Good. Yeah. Um, but from this cast, we're going to be able to look at the top of the head. This is a pretty fe fresh fish. It's not the freshest. It happens to be one out of the freezer. Um, but he's going to make really good reference cast for um, rebuilding the lower jaw, rebuilding the lip line, all the shrinkage that you see in your skin mount fish. Um, but if we were doing, you prepped this with alum because we're doing a fish. If we were doing a deer head with plaster, um, any suggestions for how they would prep their deer head? You know, you don't have the slime with the deer heads, mm -hmm. and we will get one for you. Be, get one for you because I think it's really important that people know how to make a, a good cast. Um, and I've made lots of them out 
in the field and something that works really good. You need some kind of mold release because you don't want the plaster to pull the hair out of the animal. Yeah. And so, you know, I'm making a mold of a customer's desert bighorn sheep uh, is a little, yes. little scary, but um, it's worth the risk. And uh, so what I've always done is I like to take clay, our number one stoneware clay, uh -huh. it's the inexpensive clay, mix it in a paper cup with water until I get mud. I get milkshake type yeah. mud material. Um, when I have the mud made, um, I brush it through the hair and then smooth it out and that's my mold release and the plaster will not stick to that hair and it works very well. Um, I used to, um, when I would go hunting and had hopes of maybe getting something that I could make a mold of, I always carried or had access to maybe back at camp um, plaster. I had a little ball of clay that I could mix in. You could use mud, mud will do mm -hmm. it. Um, I had plaster and I had clay and I had, uh, you know, little brushes and towels and things like that. Mm -hmm. Just if the opportunity presented itself, I really wanted to make a yeah. cast. Now, the difference between what we're doing here in a reproduction fish, although you can do it the same, if we're going to make reproduction fish, we probably use auto body putty for our mold. Um, and how come auto body putty? I think how come is because um, we hope to make more and more and more mm -hmm. of the fish. Sometimes we never yeah. get around to it. Yeah. But uh, with a study cast, one will do me. One's going to be fine. Yeah. Um, and, and you can get more than one. You can make several. But with a reproduction fish, I want to make more. I want to I want the opportunity to make 50 if I so desire it, yeah. and that would be a lot. But And bond, so Bondo would hold up a little bit better than plaster. Yeah, it'll make a little more yeah. durable mold. So the detail will doesn't chip out quite so readily. And um, um, Most of those uh, big old catfish that, and plaster is a little on the fragile side. It mm -hmm. breaks a little more than auto body putty. Any of those, um, fish molds that we made of the big old catfish um, were in our garage because we didn't have a place to store them and employees would run lawnmowers into them <laughs> and many of our really precious, precious state record yeah. molds eventually got broken from lawnmowers yeah. running into them. Um, so, and plaster is, is very heavy too. Plaster is, um, in order to be rigid enough, plaster has to be fairly thick. Um, where Bondo we can pour a little bit thinner. Um, maybe not work? quite be so heavy. Yeah, that looks good. Check that out. Mm -hmm. um, and some of those big nice. catfish, you have to have a very thick, thick, would you get that right in there yeah. for me a little more? Mm -hmm. You have to have a very thick shell so it doesn't break. And the thicker it is, um, the heavier it is, of course. And um, some of our big half a, a half a catfish probably weighed 80 to 100 pounds. Mm -hmm. And that's hard for a little guy like me to get that <laughs> off of the fish and get him out of there. Okay, now um, we're going to go into the, the plaster, making the plaster, mixing the plaster. And I'm going to get new water here. And with my, I put in probably three cups of water, which is going to be a great plenty. It doesn't take a lot of water. And mixing plaster, um, I don't want to say it's an art, but there is a technique to it. And um, it can be, it can, you can struggle to mix plaster or it's, it's, you can make it easy. Um, I'm going to put in just a small amount of alum in here, which is going to help keep my... Uh, slime from reacting with my plaster. Okay. 
and a good grade of molding plaster. Number one, I guess it comes in ones, twos, and threes. Number one molding plaster is desirable. You can get it at Lumberyards. Plaster is very inexpensive. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were looking, doing a little research earlier, and uh, that old book we were looking at says get a good grade of plaster, and plaster is expensive. It was a dollar eighty per hundred pound bag. Per hundred pound bag. That's been a little while. I bet gas was a little cheaper then too. Um, okay. We use plaster a lot in the shop. We use it in our machets, um, use it in our rock materials, things like that. It's just a, a white powder like so. Somewhere it says molding plaster over here like that. Now, um, the best way to mix plaster is like with mache, typically we put mache in a container and then we add our water and stir it up. Mm -hmm. Don't do that with plaster. Have your water sift. They say sift and we used to have a flour sifter that we always yeah. used. Um, we got lazy when we didn't have a flour sifter. But um, I'm going to sift with my hands plaster into the container until it won't saturate, the water won't saturate and it's saturated anymore. So you've got in that bucket, how much water do you think well, you have? I a couple said, inches? Yeah, yeah, probably strong couple inches. Yeah. So we're adding plaster to water. So it's just looking like this. You can take a look at it. It's sinking is what it's doing. But if I just dumped it in there in a big old gob, um, it would form a great big old dumpling in there. Yeah, it, it's very, it doesn't, um, it doesn't mix quite as well. So what you're doing is letting this slowly saturate and are, how much are you going to put in? Till it's sitting on top of the water. Now look, it's sitting on top of the water. It doesn't want to sink anymore. Um, I'm getting to a saturation point. I'm going to get a little around the edges here. Now, it's interesting, this is a chemical reaction, and when you're working with plaster, you're going you're gonna to get a feel for how this works. Mm -hmm. But this will not really start setting up until I agitate it. Once you agitate it, it's going to start setting up. What's going to speed up my plaster time, because I don't want to wait for half hour for plaster to set, is I put a little bit of alum in it, which mm -hmm. is going to keep it from reacting with the slime, and it's going to um, speed up my set time just a little yeah. bit. So now it's, it's done saturating. I don't think anything's going to sink anymore. I'm going to take, this is our mixing stick. We, use, <laughs> we mix machets. We mix everything with a rubber yeah. glove. Yeah. Um, now you mentioned catalysts or things that cause it to set up faster. Um, could you do anything else to cause it to set up a little quicker? Salt? Yep. Or warm water? Yep. So that was a warm. trick you're waiting for me. <laughs> I, was, I could see you're waiting for the answer. Um, I was just thinking, um, be careful. As you're doing this, your water temperature is critical. Um, it will cause this to set up pretty fast. If you used hot, nice, warm bathtub water um, that's comfortable to mix in, you might not get it poured um, just because it's a it's a pretty quick reaction when you add the alum to it. So any of the any of the plasters or machets, if you want to speed them up, warm water, a tiny bit of salt, not too much. Yeah. If you want to slow them down, cold water, which I have kind of cold water, that's why this is slowing, and I don't have to keep stirring it, but I'm just I can tell if it starts to thicken. Um, cold water and borax will actually yeah. slow it down. Yeah. And they do say anytime you add any of those catalysts like salt or borax, you, it's not quite as strong. So right. you might not try not to put a whole bunch of, of those additives into it, but um, a little sprinkle works really now, well. Now this is going to work, but I really could have used a little thicker mix. Um, the thinner it is, you can do this in different coats. You can do it in what's called a splash coat, which is a thin coat like this, which picks up all your detail.
Um, I think even in uh, one of those books that we were looking at earlier, they talk about the importance of a splash coat, of, of a thin coat like you're putting on right now to pick up detail. And then they'll come back um, later and reinforce it with a thicker mix. Now I'm going, I don't want to, I'm probably going to go around that whole fin and end up getting stuck, but I don't want to go too far, but we'll go ways here. Okay, and that's my, my initial coat. Um, you can do it in one coat. That will set up pretty fast. It'll set up within, oh, I'd say, probably not by the time we're done here. But um, then you just have some more mixed up and, and come in thicker and pour it right over the top. Yep. In mm -hmm. fact, that can be pretty thick where they, where they can kind of trowel that. Spatula it on. Yeah. Yep. Um, so then... Once, that, once you get your second coat on there, and once it sets up, then we're gonna take, let it harden good. It's gonna go through a heat stage. And when it goes through a heat stage, you don't wanna cook your fish. So I wanna get that off um, before it gets hot. And it's gonna start to hot, get hot, and you're gonna feel of it. And I use my fingernail to see if it dents. If it's really soft yet, when you pull it off, you're gonna crumble the detail out. So I want it to get pretty hard and I'll keep testing with my fingernail. And when I can't dent it anymore, I'll feel it. And if it's not too hot to cook the fish, I will start flipping him over and taking the fish out. Yeah, yeah. And so the thicker your mold is, the more heat it's gonna create and the hotter it's gonna get. So some do... of those big catfish turn pretty well done by the time <laughs> well, we got them out of the plaster. That's... Yeah, and that's exactly what I was going to say, is they get so warm that you can, if you cook it, if you're too thick with it and leave it in there, it really will be cooked and you're really not going to have a great cast on the other side if you were going to try and flip it. So, um, And this is one we did earlier, did the same exact thing we just did. Um, this came out really good. Like I said, it'll, it's such good detail, it really will pick up um, fingerprints, but it's got all the detail in the jaws the eye, um, the bones, the sections of the gill flap, the beginning, you got the muscle of the um, pectoral fin, the starts of the dorsal fin. There's just a lot of information here. A ton of information. But now this is the negative. This is yeah. your mold. And yeah. from this, we're gonna make, next week, we're gonna show you how to make casts. Yep. Yeah. So we'll show them how to get the positive out of yeah. that. And positives can be made out of a lot of different things. You saw that we had rubber. Um, we had a rubber deer head. The deer, yeah. Um, we have a lot of rubber bears up there and different rubber products. And I think the reason we ever started doing rubber is latex rubber is one, they're easy to get out. But yeah. when we had students and we were carrying them from desk <laughs> to desk and the students are using them, if they break something out of auto body putty or plaster, it's gone. Yeah. Um, the rubber ones have been around for 35 yeah. years and they are in still yeah. in really good shape. So the rubber is kind of good for a shop use when you're going to be careless with it and have a chance of dropping the. Anybody dropping that it. has concrete floors might want to consider rubber because when they hit the floor, they, they don't last very well. So get yourself some plaster. Um, it's very fun stuff to work with. Um, mm -hmm. It's easy. Um, there, tiny bit of learning curve, but it's not complicated things. Mix it by putting the plaster into the water first. Um, come up with, you know, just a technique of doing things and it's cheap. Plaster is mm -hmm. cheap. Number one molding plaster. Um, you can get it from us. You can get it from the hardware store and yeah. uh, always have um, a bag around. You can make your own machets with it. Um, there's lots of recipes on how to make machets, how to make rock texture material. Um, a lot of the old bases and mannequins used to be made where they would take burlap and bathe it through the mm -hmm. plaster yeah. and then smooth it over a screen shape. Yep. Um, lots of base work done with plaster. Yep. So plaster is just a good thing to have around your shop. Don't pour it in your ear. Don't pour it in your ears. Right. Who would um, do that? It might have been done before. 
Uh, we do have a question from Jim. He is wondering if you can add a burlap cloth to the top of the plaster for extra strength. And yes, sure and can. I'd do that yeah. in the next step probably, yep. I think. Yep. Yep. I think I would be careful, just like you said, make sure that the texture of that burlap doesn't come through in this first layer. Um, so pour your splash coat and then in the second layer reinforce with burlap. That's a great idea. Yep. Let this one pick up all your detail and after that's hard, you can do anything you want. And and then, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, when we show you auto body, we're going to do a mold of auto body too on different things. When you do a auto body mold, we reinforce it with fiberglass mm -hmm. for strength. Yeah. So we do have a few people who are inquiring about a one week school. And they're wondering uh, if this is the school right here. <laughs> this is the school. <laughs> Once it's a one week. hour. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> we're busy here. That's right. That's right. Um, so we're going to show them positives next week. Um, coming up at some point in time, we might talk about other. We want to make a deer muzzle yeah, for them. Yeah, deer. Um, other, you could do bird feet. Um, we've got all kinds of stuff for reference that we, as the fall goes on and fresh specimens come in, we might come back to a few different Subjects you know, and topics. some of you people have, uh, um, um, you've entered things in competition and the judge said your ear bases were wrong, your ear butts are wrong. Mm -hmm. um, a, a good thing that plaster is good for is get a nice fresh mm -hmm. deer that is not, not a mounter and carefully skin him as close as you can to the skin. Don't leave a bunch yeah. of muscle and tissue on the skin. Skin yeah. him really close to the skin, separating the muscle and tissue from the skin, all the way out to the inside of the ear. Take plaster, get it a little bit thicker than this, and pour it over that whole area. Yeah. Let it set up, pull it off, make yourself a mold of that. Mm -hmm. You can do it in different positions. Here's an ear's back. You know, you can move the real digger's ear forward. Um, it yeah. just tells you so much as far as distances and widths and heights. And I, I can't yeah. tell you how much information is there. And all you got to do is look, you know, yeah. just kind of copy what you see. Um, plaster is quick and easy and convenient. And if you have it on hand, more than likely you'll use it. So I um, hope that's a good tool for everyone to keep close this fall. And we have a giveaway today of, is it a 10 pound box? I don't know. Of I didn't. Premium bedding premium fiber. Premium bedding fiber, fiber. To go along with their plaster. Yeah. <laughs> so. um, this stuff is great stuff. I can't tell you how, how good it is. We used to, in the olden days, have a product called High Fibre. Mm -hmm. High Fibre. And uh, it's made by the Hills Brother Company. And um, I think it was asbestos mostly. Um, um, those old books that we just went through, that was their preferred bedding material. We asbestos. used to use a lot of asbestos. I used to yeah. buy asbestos in 100-pound bags. Um, and then when we couldn't get it here, we had to bring it in from Canada. We <laughs> used asbestos in all of our machets and everything. Yeah. <coughs> Didn't bother me at all. <laughs> well, um, but anyway, um, this is the best replacement we've ever had, premium bedding fiber. Um, we're the exclusive distributor of that, and it's a yeah. great, it's great. And yeah. you buy it once, you don't have to buy it again. Don't, don't throw this away when it's done. Yeah. Put it in a bag and save it. Yeah. And the winner is? The winner is AJ Banagiran. And I'm not sure I said your last name <laughs> right, so I'm sorry. AJ, you're going to like AJ, it and yeah, use it good for stuff. lots of different uses in the taxidermy, mm -hmm. taxidermy industry. Keep it in your refrigerator. Always have it on hand and it'll be ready for you next time you find something you need to make mold up. We have a real quick question that came Ooh. through. Does that work for the eyes on deer? N no, like a clay I'm thinking they're saying? Um, I was, it would make a good mold if they wanted to make a mold of the eye. Um, if the hair, maybe, like yep. you had, yep, yep. Um, maybe make a slurry into oh. the hair and, and make that exterior mold. Of the um, plaster? Of, with plaster, um, they could make that mold over the eye. I think, maybe. Um, but not for a clay. 
Oh, no. Yeah, correct, correct. Sorry, I understand what well, you're I'm saying. Well, I'm not sure either. <laughs> okay, next week we're going to probably have another, well, we'll, we'll make some positives as this, something that mm -hmm. you can hold. Another thing these are good for, really good for, is once you make your positive, um, paint them. You know, mm -hmm. you, can, you can airbrush them, you can hand paint them, you can tip scales. Um, any of these reproduction pieces uh, make several and practice yeah. painting on them. They're great. Halloween's coming. Halloween's coming. You can go as a bass. <laughs> <laughs>